Hi there. Jess and the rest of the Pay Play Profit Podcast team are taking a break for the next few months. During that time, we'll be replaying some of the most popular episodes from the past that you may have missed. Thanks for supporting Pay Play Profit, and we hope you're having a wonderful 2023. Welcome to another episode of the Pay Play Profit Podcast. I'm your host, Jessica May, and today, Marilyn Parham, founder of The Bottom Line, is back in the house hanging out with me for today's episode. Yay, it's Marilyn. Podcast day, Marilyn. (laughs) Glad to be here. Yeah, I'm glad you're here, too. And I'm really glad about the topic we're going to do today, which requires a substantial amount of faith, I think, in order to pull it off which is discovering how to live your ideal entrepreneurial life. This is actually me doing a kind of a somewhat off-the-cuff book review of the EOS life that Gino Wickman wrote and released recently. And Marilyn and I are just going to do what we do and kind of jam about all the things in the book and excited for it so it's time to set the table for today's episode so we can get right down to it if you're new listen up and if you've been here before you know the drill it's time for us to share our tbl truth that quote every decision is a profit decision and profit is measured in time energy and money i'd also like to remind you that when you think of finance and tax just think of ice cream and i am being serious Right, Marilyn? Like we're being serious about that. We love our ice cream. (laughs) Because we have three cones for time, energy, and money. We want three cones, time, energy, and money. And what's the goal on each of those cones, Marilyn? Triple scoops. Triple scoops, baby. Because triple scoops means the best profit decisions are happening with our time, energy, and money, which means more pay, play, and profit in your business and life today. Here we go. Mm. Discovering how to live your ideal entrepreneurial life. Have you discovered yours yet, Marilyn? It sounds so easy, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Sounds like a sentence you can just that just rolls right off the tongue and sounds like a great idea. It's a it's just a lifelong journey, actually. So. Yeah. Cause you you really to me. I think the, one of the first things I want to say about this is there's kind of this freelancer, the sole proprietor, the small business owner, and then there's the entrepreneur, you know, like I, I think we loosely exchange those words, you know, and we kind of think they're all the same thing, but they're, they're really not. There really is a journey, like you're saying, in a season to your efforts, like the first thing you try to do when you figure out you just don't want to keep doing what you're doing with other people is like, I want to do something for myself. And I'm going to freelance for a while, get some extra money, side hustle, whatever. I'm not really changing my whole life. I'm just adding to it at this point. Absolutely. Then you kind of get the bug and all of a sudden you want to go legit, make it official. So you become a sole proprietor, single member LLC. Now people attach their entity to their legitimacy, but we know that that's not true. That's not the case. No. No. And then all of a sudden... This thing that you decided to just give a try turns into a small business. Mm -hmm. And then at that point, we like to call her, like even all in the back in the freelancer stage, like freelancer doesn't sound fancy enough. I'm an entrepreneur. (laughs) But really, entrepreneurial by definition is like you're starting things, quitting things, owning multiple things. It's a very investor minded, solution driven, disruption, solving problems, but it's not really so much staying in one place. And growing in that one place. Does that make sense? Not from my perspective. It, it does make, I mean, you, there's levels of entrepreneurship for sure. And you can be small and still be kind of entrepreneurial. Heck yeah. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. But, you know, if you own a business and you work in that business and you really don't do much else, you're a small business owner. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. That's behaving entrepreneurially within that business from my perspective. And I just think it's important to understand where you're at in your seasons and the journey and what that needs to look like. And a lot of times freelancers, sole proprietors and small business owners, many of us aspire to be an entrepreneur doing multiple things. And you and I are in different seasons. You've been in, you've been very entrepreneurial for a long time. 
and you're very investor minded. And I tend to be right now in the season of my life and career, very operationally minded in hopes that I can grow up to kind of dip into more of the, but I'm very entrepreneurially driven. I just, you know, when we talk about, and he talks about it in the book about pursuing other passions, you know, as well as I do recently, you and I've been talking about that from my seat. I'm just freaking the hell out, you know, like. It's scary. I feel like I'm cheating on this business. Yes. You, <laughs> you do. know, and I, I know, and I just think, well, that's just crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and it's it's just really funny. And, you know, your season of life, your stages. I was doing my dishes today. I've decided I love washing dishes, especially with the new apron my husband bought me. That's part of the discovering your entrepreneurial life. And when I was doing my dishes today, I just thought to myself, like, okay, what's next? And that really is kind of the entrepreneurial way to always be asking that question of what's next and what's coming and kind of wrestling those things out. And when Gino wrote this book, he really wanted to kind of cast vision for the visionary, the business owner, the entrepreneur, the operator, whoever it was to kind of figure out what it is they actually wanted, and which I thought was pretty pretty fantastic because we're all sold on EOS, right? We are. Yes. We went to the show. We bought the t-shirt. We're sold out for EOS and it's working. It's been worth the journey. And it's not been an easy journey, but it's been worth the journey. And we kind of do this with our clients where we kind of want to know what they want so we can take them on their journey using our processes. But EOS starts with like, just get into that meeting and start making traction and commit to EOS and then just see what unfolds. Mm -hmm. That's right. And it's almost like this book, The EOS Life, becomes, it's kind of like the Star Wars movie where I get so confused where it's like, but, oh, these movies are actually the first part of the saga, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but they came after all these mm -hmm. movies. Right. That's how I feel about this book. It's like it, it came episode after one or episode four. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It came after. And honestly, I think that's how you should absorb it, to be perfectly honest with you, because you don't know enough yet about yourself, in my opinion, based on my experience, to know what kind of ideal entrepreneurial life you actually really want. Right. And EOS, you know, just in, you know, in their uh, makeups, not really intended for a solopreneur. Right. It's yeah, it's for someone with teams of 10 to 250. Mm -hmm. And you have to kind of figure out who you are and um, what you want before you dive into that. Into the it's place. kind of like when that baby small business decides to be a real small business. And then you go through the hurdles of what that growth looks like and the cycles of suffering you will inevitably wade through, as we've told every single person on the planet who'll listen. And we even had a little like we were kind of Michael Hyatt. Well, they're called Full Focus now, company Michael Hyatt launched, and we do the Full Focus Planner, and they have this process of the ideal week. So we've been doing a lot of vision casting over the last 10 years and and working through that process. And I would say that that's what this book is about, is casting vision for yourself and what the next stage and the next step looks like and and understanding who you are as a person and the season of life you're in. So that's why I wanted to mention that, because you're, you're very much in a different season than me. Sure. And I'm older than you, <laughs> not by much <laughs> enough. How much older? <laughs> About 10 years. Oh, mm -hmm. really? there's that much of a gap. Yeah, I'm an old we're, soul. Only, we're only as old as we, you know, you're a young yeah. soul and I'm an old soul. So we meet right where it counts in all the right ways for sure. And I have to tell you that if you're going on a journey with someone, it's a whole different experience than doing it by yourself. Right. Most definitely. Yes. Because you've also done that too. You've kind of been that freelancer, sole proprietor situation. And then you have partners, not just in this business, but in other businesses you belong to. And I imagine all those relationships are different. Very much so. <laughs> and you got to approach them. You know, they're all relational, frankly. Yeah. So. Yeah. And that has to factor in who you're doing the ride with. And he talks about that in this book as well. And so I just 
wanted to gap about it with you and process some of the things he says here to give the peeps a sneak peek of what they should do when they're ready to dip their toe into it as well. The book is a really good book. It's a lightweight book. The gist of it is to do what you love with people you love, make a huge difference, get compensated accordingly, and still have time for other passions. That's the EOS life from Gino Wickman's perspective. And the first chapter that he has in the six chapters is doing what you love. And when I read this particular one, I felt so ready for this chapter finally. Like, do you feel like you do what you love most of the time? Most of the time, I mean, there's seasons where you got to step back and think, what am I doing? <laughs> but most of the time, I got, I got to say that, yeah, I do like what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And I think what I found surprising about this doing what you love chapter, it ended up being a chapter about delegation. And I wanted to just throw it out the window. <laughs> because how many times have we seen these four box quadrant worksheets no matter who you go visit when you're talking about learning how to delegate mastering delegation there's always four boxes and you can never put everything you do in all those damn boxes because you can't remember all the things you do but there was one sentence in particular because again I think he's really casting vision for visionaries inside EOS organizations about what's happening the typical visionary loves jobs like research and development of products and services, building relationships, creative problem solving, selling, spending time with customers or clients, focusing on growth, building culture, strategic planning, and coming up with ideas. And I thought, you have just connected with a part of my soul that I knew no one knew about. <laughs> you really do know how to write visionaries so well. I'm going to like borrow this from the book. And that's it. And I think to your point as well, like you've been a founder of the bottom line. You still continue to serve in the bottom line. You've been on the leadership team since we've been in the bottom line. And you're kind of moving into that next season of your entrepreneurial life where you're hopefully going to start really reaping a lot of fruit from all this hard work that you've put in all these years. And would you say it's the ride that you didn't expect, but the ride you're glad you had? Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, most of the time I'll, I look back on, on the journey and think, wow, I mean, it's divinely, you know, given, you know, I just put one foot in front of the other, but you look back on it and think, okay, I, I see that. I'm glad I did it. And I'm ready to just transition, you know, it's just a transition. I'm looking forward to, you know, not being as much of the doer, which has been a long journey. Right. And watching things run without me more so I love that I actually do I really love that I know it's been exciting to see some things happen it's been hard but once you get to the other side of the hard you realize it was a good hard and uh, I think all we can hope for is just wisdom and understanding every time we make a new decision so that's kind of can we celebrate that prospect that we feel that we look younger and we're also Oh, so much wiser, for sure. Oh, so much wiser. <laughs> and, you know, we had the choice to quit it or stick it. We chose to stick it because we believe in what we're doing and we enjoy what we're doing most of the time. And I, I think that's really cool. And what he goes on about in this process, and I think there's an order to why he did it this way, is if doing what you love is all about those things you're gifted at and that you create value doing, right? Like... You are incredibly valuable as our as a person in general, as am I, as is our team like this. But then you're also incredibly valuable as our founder, as our guiding CPA in the business. Like there's so much value you've contributed. And it's almost like it, the value you keep giving it keeps getting better. Where we've been in this season in the business for a long time now, where we feel like the service and actually putting our head down and doing the work and making the clients okay was like the thing, the value. But now that we're actually getting to taste and see a totally different way of being in the business, you're like, I'm, I personally am like, now that's worth 10 times the pennies we pay for. Sure. You know, and it's all about, yeah, doing the things that we, only we can do so this is why we signed up for this taco stand 
just getting glimpses of that. And he he talks a lot, like I said in this chapter about delegation, because he tells you to delegate one thing per quarter. And he said he shared his story where he's delegated one thing per quarter for the last 20 years of his career. And I thought, because that makes so much sense, because you're constantly like pruning. We talk about pruning. It's biblical and it's spiritual for us in that sense. I mean, there's always got to be this piece of you that goes away. So it can make room for the new thing or in the, and the thing that hopefully you're, you really enjoy. And that was his advice, delegate one thing per quarter. And he's been doing it consistently, according to his words in his book for the last 20 years. Yeah, that, that consistency is key, right? It's amazing. And some of the big things, he delegated some big things like his company. <laughs> he literally was like, I don't want to do any more of this and I'm going to get out. I'm going to let it continue, but I'm going to get out. Like, I'm going to delegate the whole shebang. So it's pretty cool. And I can see how it's, like, really important to understand. And then, of course, he mentioned the accountability chart. And I'm like, that damn thing. Never am going to get away from it. <laughs> that is That has been, to me, the the gem. And it's been so hard to get there and nail it down and make it right. But it to me, that's that's worth the whole thing. Yeah. So, and the reason why is because that accountability chart means everyone has a seat and everyone that's sitting on it, it's the right thing that the business needs at that time. And it's being taken care of by the right person. And that right person believes it too. And there's magic. And then there's clarity on the lines of communication and who's having conversations with who for their development and growth. And it has been one of the most difficult parts of EOS, in my opinion. But his, it is absolutely, like you said, the gym. That was a great way to phrase that. And then learning how to delegate. Do you, are you a master delegator, Marilyn? No, I've never been a master delegator. I've gotten a little better, but I've never been a master delegator. Me neither. And I feel like you and I, it's been very challenging to delegate. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just easier to do it yourself, or at least in your head, you know, but that's not true long term. And I feel like you kind of held on to things and the way, so your delegation was a little differently because of that practicality sense, right? Of like, I might as well just do it myself. Now, I personally have no problem telling people what to do. <laughs> she and you it. don't necessarily either, but I have no problem finding things for people to do. But I can be very close vested like you where it's like nobody can do this but me. And it's just going to take me more time and they're not going to do it the right way and uh, whatever. I have more emotional cycles than you do about delegating. But it's still the same. It's still the whole same thing. This limiting belief you have in your head that it's just faster if I keep doing it. But then you're saddled with things you don't want to do and you're supposed to be doing what you love. So that's the first chapter. It's not you sitting down figuring out your eat, pray, love moments. It's you sitting down learning how to delegate and getting your damn accountability chart right. Who knew? And the fruit is you'll be eventually doing what you love in your ideal entrepreneurial life. The next chapter is with people you love. So doing what you love with people you love. And I have to tell you, they, he opens the book with a quote from Zig Ziglar. You will either look back in life and say, I wish I had, or I'm glad I did. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's true? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we I wish all I had, had, or I'm glad I did. I wish I had. It's sort of, we all have regrets. I mean, there, you can't avoid those, mm -hmm. but I, I hope that I'm glad I did outweigh the wish I had. Yeah. So remember that year we went to ZeroCon and we listened to Dan DePony, which is a monk turned entrepreneur, and he talked about energy vampires. Absolutely. This is the freaking short chapter in the EOS Life from Gina Wickman's perspective about finding your energy vampires and frankly avoiding them. So he talked, this is an energy conversation. So one of the things I found very impactful in this book was there's a difference between people you love and people you love doing things with. And you need to know the difference. Because there are people you love that you don't necessarily want to be around, right? So this is about doing what you love with the people you love. 
And there is a something distinctly different about loving the person and loving doing things with the person. Yeah, I get that. And so he talks about who are the people you love to work with. And he, in particular, talks about the leadership team. When your leadership team meets every week, the meeting should be filled with laughter, intense debate, passionate discussion, high trust, and respect. You should look forward to working together and seeing each other. Except I think he needs to caveat this to say, this is like the goal and you might not get it in the first three years. That's right. Of adopting EOS. Because there's there's way more intense debates than there is laughter sometimes. Absolutely. There's actually tears on occasion. And we've even had it, you know, it's almost like we're officially in the messy middle of this, getting to the other side of this. And they even expect you to have really high turnover in your leadership team in particular in the first one to three years of EOS as well. Because you just don't know what you know. And as you work the process of EOS, it gets freaking worked out if you're committed to it. And and we did commit to it from the very beginning. If this meant that, you know, we had complete turnover, then that's what it, it, it needed to happen in order to get to the other side. And another thing he said, if you dread meetings and find yourself avoiding your coworkers, there's a problem because that's not living. But it's also a recipe for who you spend your time with in life. And I think it's Jim Rohn that said, you are the average sum of the five people you spend the most time with. Mm -hmm. And again, I struggle with codependent behavior. I'm a very enabling person when I'm not healthy and paying attention to that when I'm working with people. And I can easily get on that trickster's triangle where I'm moving from hero to villain to victim in relationships. And that's draining. That's that's when you got to recognize, like, what's happening here? What energy vampires am I around? Because you have tons of relationships. And so he really wants you to focus on when you're discovering the, your ideal entrepreneurial life, like who gives you energy, who does who gives you energy versus takes energy. But then you and I also know people are people. They're not perfect. And I don't think you can make that decision about a person just based on a day. No, based on the day. And I, I've pondered before, I mean, if you look back at your earlier self, how many friends that you had, it was a ton, you know, and then later in life, I think you just get wise. You just, you don't, you don't need that many. You need, you need a lot of acquaintances, but the inner circle, the friends, the ones you love tends to get smaller. Yeah, it does. And I battled a lot, too, with, like, dealing with bitterness in relationships because there's always kind of this balance you're chasing or some reciprocity or, you know, what's the give and take look like? Is it free-flowing? Is it honorable? Is it intentionally filled well? And you you know your takers from your givers. And you know, you know those people. You can feel it in your whole soul. And honestly, it's not, it feels like you're characterizing people. Because to some extent you are, but this is about you making a decision. We just opened the podcast up with every decision is a profit decision and profit is measured in time, energy, and money. It's just a decision about who do I want to spend most of my time with that, that really gives me energy and has fun. Because one of the things he says was he told a story about a company who basically the person wanted to sell the business. And then they went through the EOS process. And a year later, they had complete 100% turnover, basically, in their leadership team. And he said the company finished their last year with over $15 million in revenue. And the owner turned around or, or the visionary turned around and turned down a large offer to sell because he was just having too much fun with his team. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. And that's pretty cool. Yeah. And it says, regardless of where you are on the spectrum, today is the day to start moving the needle toward the high end, meaning doing what you love with the people you love. So I thought that was kind of cool. And they use that handy dandy people analyzer. He says you should actually people analyze everybody in your life. And you should also find out what your personal core values are, because we use core values in the business. And you should determine what your personal core values are. I actually did this exercise. Um, because they use a company called Think to Perform and they have a core values deck because he tells you to people analyze every single person in your life. Which sounds kind of crazy, right? Yeah. <laughs> how can I, 
can a people analyze my brother? <laughs> yeah, because remember, there's people you love and people you love being with. And it's kind of hard to swallow because it's making you understand yourself. And if there's any dysfunction or energy drains happening, like where are they happening? Why are they happening? And how often do you want those things to continue? Because you're not rehabbing people. You're just analyzing them against what you want more of in your life. Feels very cold and calculated for sure. It, wouldn't want does. Anybody, it really does. Yeah, wouldn't want anybody to come across that. But at the end of the day, you said life is too short. And you need to be in places that really give to you. And then he says, then just start expanding your circle, which I have a hard time doing. Mm -hmm. It's it's a little difficult when when you work virtually and we're an online, you know, company, to, totally virtual. It's kind of hard unless you intentionally get into groups and circles, um, you know, deliberately to widen that circle. Well, we've talked about that, too, in our business. We're like, we got to live outside of our bubble because let me tell you, and COVID did us no favors. Because for those of us who were fine in our bubble, man, that was just a good reason to stay in the bubble and put some kind of protective coating over the bubble and everything else, you know. And we've even talked about how we've got to, as a culture, live outside of the bubble and bring things into the bubble. And that's kind of what he's talking about. But with those tools of analyzing people and knowing thyself, you can figure out who to, who to invite in. So I thought that was cool. It, it it takes energy to do that too, right? So there's a balance. There's a balance there, but you're always better inviting people in, just the right people. Oh, and it's draining to me. I'm just a natural in introvert. And I know that shocks people, but I'm deeply introverted. And it takes a lot of energy to expand the circle for me. What about you? Um, you know, it doesn't it doesn't take a lot for me to to talk to people, but to actually invest in people, it does take a lot. Like, um, you just, I'm just wired that way. I just don't want to waste my time. <laughs> that sounds <laughs> awful, but. <laughs> no, that's what we go through. That's how we process for sure. The next thing was making a huge difference. So doing what you love with the people you love and you want to make a huge difference. I would liken this to, remember how I'm doing this anti-procrastination personal development? And I've discovered about myself that money actually matters to me. Not that it it's my saving grace or whatever, but I because I have baggage around money and I don't, I just have issues saying money mean, you and I went through this thing where you're, you're motivated by money, meaning, or freedom. And I, I think at the time yours was freedom. And I think at the time mine was meaning. But one of the things I learned about myself is like, I struggle to be extrinsically motivated, but I'm deeply passionate about creating things so that other cool things can happen. And I believe money is a tool and a vehicle to get there. But what I really discovered, I'm like, why am I having such an issue with saying money means something to me and it's a motivator and it's this right here. What I actually determined through my core values, I decided my five core values using that card deck I just told you about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have to do meaningful work. If I'm not doing anything meaningful for my work, money, you just might as well hang me up to dry because I'm not going to be motivated. I'm not a, I'm not a take it and run girl around money. No, no you're definitely not. And I think that's what makes a difference. Like making a huge difference. How do you know if it's not aligning to your values? And then how can you be confident to say things like money is a motivator to me? When you're fighting back this imposter syndrome of I must be greedy or whatever, mis misaligned or whatever with what I'm trying to do. But then you you take it all back and you realize that making a huge difference does matter. If we're it's kind of like what you said about the people. You want to invest, invest in relationships that are gonna make a huge difference in your life and you you have the ability to make a huge difference in theirs. Would you say that that's fair? That's fair. And uh, money's a tool, right? So when money matters, of course, it matters. It matters to all of us to some more than others based on 
like you said, their history and their baggage, but also just the way they're wired. And there's nothing wrong with that. It, it's, you know, I get it. I get your comments that you say, and it's kind of hard to say in our society, but that's, it, you're, you're not interested in only the money, it's the meaning behind it that then is, is reflective of the money. Leveraging so. the tool of creating that, that asset and what it can happen as a result of it. And Gino put in his book an example of a visionary of an e-commerce business where he realized what he most loved to do was to be a thought leader and to build community around his company and his clients. But when you're in an e-commerce company, it's hard to talk about anything other than selling your widgets. Now, developing a brand and creating a community, that takes a whole lot more than just selling widgets. It's kind of like in, in our world as accountants and tax pros and profit advisors, like it's really easy to get consumed by the client work and just make the client work the only thing that matters and the priority of all that. So one of the things he said in his story is that this visionary ended up delegating to their integrator and started delegating more. So see, he's bringing in more of this because the visionary basically wasn't feeling like he was doing anything that mattered. They were just selling widgets, you know, kind of like my make money conversation. I can't just sit there and make money. It's got to do something. So he actually put himself into a position through delegation and the accountability chart to start doing more meaningful work. And a year later, the fruit was that the business benefited and became consistently profitable for the first time in its 20 year history. Awesome. Because he was playing in the wrong seat for way too long. And the company wasn't getting any lift from that. So like making a huge difference is important. I think everybody should be asking that all the time about anything that they're doing. I think you're really good at this and you have been for a while. Like you have a rope and once you're at the end of it, that's it, folks. That's it. <laughs> like now it's a really long you. rope, but put me in charge of HR and it's a shorter rope. <laughs> <laughs> that is a true story. That was the I didn't shortest. Like it. I didn't want it. <laughs> Get me out of it. <laughs> yeah. <It's impossible. laughs> exactly. Another thing that he talked about here is that part of our role is to create leaders. So we're not creating helpers, we're creating leaders. And we really, we felt that way long before EOS. And man, if you want to test your leadership, just put out the beacon that you just want to create more leaders. Because let us let me tell you, the mirror, uh, Trevenia Barber, one of our clients and a good friend of ours, she always talks about the mirror and the magnifying glass. And man, uh, but that is so rewarding how we, you know, if you think back to all the people who've worked through our virtual halls and walls, like, 99% of them have developed, like they gained a new skill or were courageous enough to do something different, launch a business or get into a field they might not have ever otherwise been able to do at the time that they did it. And I love that about us. I do too. We, we, we do pour into people I'm, and I'm, I want to do that. And I'm proud of that. Uh, it's not just workers. We actually train and, and build up. And yes. Coach up. Yes. So I think that's been a very rewarding part of our business and our culture because we do invest heavily in our team and our people. Doesn't mean everybody's always happy, but we care very deeply here. And we have that, you know, we're going to love you on the way in and we're going to love you on the way out. And we're going to love you in between. And that's just basically how it's going to work. And we're going to be honest about it all along the way. And as honest as we are, we want you to be as honest with us. And those are, those are big deals. I mean, I, I really do. Our culture, which you started. I mean, I've said this before to you and I've said it on the podcast, but you truly have taught me what family unconditional love looks like, right? Like we've learned it through. Jesus Christ as the holy example of it. And this friendship has been just one of the biggest, most impactful things that I've ever had the privilege and gift of having in my entire life. Oh, thank you, Jess. And when you get a taste and see of what that actually looks like with minimal dysfunction, I'm not saying we don't have dysfunction. <laughs> 
we all have dysfunction let's be real yeah but when you get a taste and see of that you're just like i'm never going back but i'm gonna have to also grow up because i don't i don't know that i can trust this i don't know what this looks like i you know and so i think it's really cool when you can do what you love with the people you love and you're making a huge difference because i i truly feel that in my whole soul about ultimately where we've landed from my perspective right now mine too it's the beautiful thing and it gets clearer and more where we want it to be you know day after day week after week we you know we circled the drain for a while right until eos kind of threw us off that i'm telling you like we changed but eos was a definite catalyst it's been one of the most impactful experiences of my entire life from a professional perspective in all the years I've been doing business. Right. And it wouldn't have been, I agree with you. And it wouldn't have been as impactful if we hadn't have done it on top of the BAC business accelerator with. And we wouldn't have known about EOS unless Trevenia invited me to that webinar. So like there was all these divine players, you know, and God knew. Mm -hmm. Exactly. God knew he did. Chapter four being compensated appropriately. I I think we could do a whole episode on compensation. I don't want to stay here too long. Other than there is, it's kind of like when we talk about financials, there's the profit side, there's the tax side, and there's the cash flow side. And I really feel like compensation is three-dimensional as well. Because yes, there's the money we all want to make. And then there's the money we need to make. And then there's the money we dream of in terms of compensation and let me tell you your eyes are going to always be bigger than your stomach (laughs) and they're always for the most part until you kind of get into the right rhythm and you've dealt with whatever healing you need to deal with around your finances whether it's being scared and putting your head in the sand or overspending or underspending I mean I could go on forever this is definitely a feeling conversation to me when Gino talks about being compensated appropriately and because we all have an idea of what we think we should be getting paid and what we think we're worth and what we need versus what we want. It's like so tricky, right? Very much so. And but this there is, is a number. It, there's a number, but you also have to measure it with your personal side of things and mm-hmm. then with your business side of things. Exactly. And those are, are sometimes different. Well, there's phases and stages. And then there's the decisions that is going to make it a reality and then expect to grow. And then the bar changes, shifts, moves, and it's, it's a rock'em sock'em robot to me. I think this is one of the shorter chapters in his book. And I think he could actually write a whole psychological book (laughs) around this one chapter. Again, I think to me, it was, it was one of the, and it's just my personality because I'm a numbers girl. Right. But, um, it was part of the EOS that I loved too. It's like when you define those functions, those roles, those seats, and then put a compensation with it, that's less about feeling and more about what is this worth? What what would it take to hire somebody and, and do this? And then you get up to the, the owner's box and then there's a separate compensation that's a little more Flowing which is what, that. yeah, which is what's helpful for profit first. But that value conversation is really what you're trying to hit because he talks about understanding value. Because I remember when we coached with Tina Forsyth years ago, and I told her in a session, I'm like, what I'm doing right now feels like super easy money. Because, and she was like, of course it is because you're doing what you're gifted at. Doesn't feel like work at all. Doesn't mean you didn't have to work hard for it. It just didn't energetically fit. And it felt like you were being valued and being compensated appropriately for that value. And I have to tell you, this is an area I struggle with deeply because I have been trained and conditioned to believe that unless I'm pulling some lever or typing on my keyboard or having some kind of conversation, anything else I do isn't worth paying for. Unless I'm physically doing something. And I'd say that that's a common. Uh, thought I mean it's in our society it's just common so you you just sort of have to break out of that mindset you have to learn there's all kinds of ways of doing and there's all kinds of value and you Mm got to work through that Mm -hmm. and so this is probably one of the trickier pieces but what I loved about this one was 
he does want the triple scoops. He wants everybody to win. So this isn't about you collecting all the cash and then running off with it. In fact, leaders often eat last in this regard. But there has to be a time when you're understanding, I want to be paid and I want to be paid this. And this is valuable. And you can speak to that value from a very confident place. And your business can support that value and what that looks like. But one of the things he says to do is, to determine how close are you to earning 100% of what you want to earn? What would it look like to be at 100%? Why are you not there yet? What would it take to get to 100%? So this isn't your business's sole responsibility to compensate you. This is about you understanding what appropriate compensation looks like for you. And then you going through all these six questions he asks you and figuring out how to solve the issue of appropriate compensation because there's layers to it does that make sense it does um it, it, as you said it's a little tricky and it, we all we bring our baggage to it so you have to kind of set that aside as much as possible and actually do the exercise yeah, yeah you do and you have to do the work you just can't put it on a spreadsheet throw it in the air and say let's make it happen right mm -hmm. you just there's a lot of work that has to happen the fifth chapter was with time for other pa passions. So doing what you love with people you love, making a huge difference, being compensated appropriately with time for other passions. And this is where he introduces that age old concept of you have to learn how to say no so that you have opportunity to say yes to the things that you want to pursue. So the way you build this muscle is you say no a lot. And you understand that you can't, I mean, he didn't say it in these words, but my pastor once said one time, you can't serve living water from a dry well. So if at the end of the day, you're empty, you're not going to have any time to do anything else. And you need the full tank. Yeah, and I can, I totally love this chapter. Yes. You know, yes. You know, if there's something I like to do, it's to play. Yes. So. Yeah. It is the play part, right? It's pay, play, pay, play, profit. That's the cycle. And this is, this definitely ties into how are you playing? What are you doing to fill your tank up? Uh, we learned that there's a difference between burnout and depletion. It takes a lot longer to fill your tank, folks, when you're depleted, because there is literally nothing left. Whereas burnout is really situational and circumstantial. And there are some things you can do to revive and energize yourself. But Depletion is a whole different story. And you can throttle along and do a few little things when you're burnt out. But when you're depleted, you can absolutely do nothing, you know, and it's going to take a lot more time and a lot more work to get that thing to fill up without all the leaky holes. And I think people who play well do better at this, which this has been a very big challenge for me. But I think you're getting so much better at it, Jessica. I do too. Mm -hmm. I'm going to agree with you. I mm -hmm. think I am. Mm -hmm. So, and it's fun because once you get a taste and see, you're like, nope, not going back there. Mm -hmm. exactly. I mean, that's what happens. Taste and see. I love that. Taste and see. And when you get a taste and see, it's like, I'm not going back. Mm -hmm. It's not happening, you know. And then the last thing is the chapter six, living your ideal life. And this is just basically sticking to your disciplines. And not settling and trying to be aware when you're tracking back into old habits or old situations or old relationships that aren't energizing you and helping you live your ideal entrepreneurial life, that you're pulling back the curtain and you're kind of calibrating to get it back on track. This is, to me, it's the on track, off track conversation. And we all get off track. I mean, that that's what rings with me. It's like, you can't expect not to. You just got to recognize it and bring the correct course as quick as possible. So I loved the book. It was a quick read. I think it's a read that, you know, if you are you dig it and you're into it, you should probably read it at least once a year just to calibrate yourself and remind yourself because it's really easy to lose track and lose sight of what you're doing while you're doing it. And It's important to know where you're on track and off track so you can kind of calibrate and get to the next thing. Because a lot of times for entrepreneurs, pursuing other passions means trying something new and going in a different direction or adding to the plate. And you need capacity to do that. And our greatest hope is that you do so with joy on your journey. Anything else you'd like to add before we close that, Marilyn? No, I mean, you've said it beautifully right there. So yeah. thank you. Awesome. Thanks for coming on, spending time with me on the podcast and giving the people your magic. Enjoy it as always.
That's a wrap, folks. Thanks for joining us on another episode of the Pay, Play, Profit podcast. Before we walk away from the table, it's sharing is caring time because we are on a mission as a team at the bottom line to multiply and to help you multiply too. We are sowing seeds in faith to serve 100,000 entrepreneurs like you by the year 2030. We want to help others reimagine their entrepreneurial success with simple, practical, powerful solutions. This podcast is the place we want people to plug in and keep coming back to. If you haven't yet, please hit subscribe wherever you choose to listen. You can find us on all the major platforms, including YouTube. We'd like to encourage you to join our growing community by signing up for our email list so you never miss an episode or value-added shares delivered each week. The link is in our show notes. We'd also love if you'd take a few minutes to give us a five-star review wherever you listen and share our podcast with a fellow entrepreneur that you believe would benefit from being here. Remember, every decision is a profit decision and profit is measured in time, energy, and money. We want to see triple scoops on all three kinds of yours when it comes to your pay, play, and profit. You are worthy of all the good, my friend, and so much more. Until next time, be kind to yourself and each other. See you later.